Can you hear me now? There he is. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you, you can hear me? I can't hear your side. Oh, you can't hear me at all? Hmm. Okay then, well. Let me see. How about now? Can you hear me now? Still can't hear me? Well, built in microphone, built in. Hello, 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 hello. Can you hear me now? No, it it's saying it's on that the that my can't hear. Can you hear me? Oh, you froze up. How about now? Gotcha. There we go. Perfect. All right. Well, that's good. I didn't say anything important, so you didn't miss anything. All right. So we are in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. So a couple of apologies here as we begin tonight. First, apologies. And I get your test screen. It's because there's just so many of you in the class. It's just overwhelming. <laughs> so I didn't have a chance to get those done. Uh, I will have that and the rough drafts done by next Thursday. Or sooner, so I will get that to you ASAP. Uh, also, <laughs> as you saw, there was no video lecture. Uh, part of that is that when I sat down and planned out this course, I've never taught this course before, so I just simply divided up the way that it seemed natural to divide it up. <laughs> and then I got to Ezra and Nehemiah and realized there's not a whole lot to say about Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther. There's a lot to discuss, There's not a whole lot of, of lecture. Uh, so I thought, well, I could do a 30 second lecture and post it, or I could just say everything that I'm gonna say in class. So I chose that route uh, rather than, than doing a lecture. Uh, not a whole lot in Esther either, and really not a whole lot in Ruth either. Uh, all three or all four of those books are really good for discussion. There's a lot of just fascinating things in each book. Um, but unless I just kind of regurgitate back to you all the scholarly theories on those interesting issues, and then we just rehash it all in class again, it just seems kind of redundant. So I can't guarantee that there'll be an actual lecture on Esther uh, next week either. Um, so. Uh, probably the biggest issue with Ezra and Nehemiah is that there are sections that are not written in Hebrew, uh, which makes it a little unique. There are actually sections that are written in Aramaic. So from Ezra chapter 4, verse 8, until chapter 6, verse 18, which is the letters that are going back and forth, uh, as well as chapter 7, verses 12 through 26, those sections are written in Aramaic. Uh, the challenge is that Aramaic looks the same as Hebrew. So you can't necessarily just glance at it and be like, oh, that's not Hebrew. You know, it's not like you pick up your Bible and you're like, oh, I think that's Spanish. Um, it, it, it's not, uh, it's not, quite that, uh, not quite that helpful. Um, Oftentimes, it is uh, Ezra and Nehemiah is put right before Chronicles in the Hebrew Bible here. Um, so if you were to flip to uh, Ezra uh, chapter 5, for instance, and look at it, it looks exactly the same as everything else. It doesn't look any different than the Hebrew. Um, you, if you look at it, 
and just look at the endings. That's usually how I can tell is that in Aramaic, a plural ending is a nun rather than a mem. So in Hebrew, we usually have something that ends in im. So Elohim is gods. Well, in Aramaic, it would be Elohim if they used the same word. It would end in a nun. So sometimes you can just look at it and be like, oh, that's, uh, that's Aramaic because of all the nuns. Um, and then the other uh, obnoxious thing is that um, the definite article in Hebrew is a he, which is the letter H. So um, God is Elohim, the God is Ha Elohim. In, uh, in, in Aramaic, they actually put the article at the end of the word. So instead of Elohim, it would be Elohim, and it would be Elohim a. Uh, and then that's the gods. So it, it's a little, little bit more tricky. So you, you, almost have to, you almost have to look at it and be like, oh, there's a lot of alephs at the end of words and no hays, and there's a lot of nuns and no mems. This must be Aramaic. Uh, but sometimes it's just easier to remember that sections of Ezra and Daniel, those are the Aramaic sections of scripture. Everything else in the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. We have Aramaisms, which is what we refer to when you take a, a Aramaic word and insert it where you would have expected a Hebrew word. Um, Psalm 2 ends with, kiss the son lest he be angry with you for his anger flares up in a moment. The word for son is, um, is the word um, bara, uh, bar, from which we get bar mitzvah, which is actually not the uh, Hebrew word for son, the Hebrew word for son is ben, ben mitzvah, and bat mitzvah. For whatever reason, though, we use the Aramaic version and say bar, bar, so Barnabas, son of encouragement, bar Abbas, son of the father, bar uh, Jesus shows up at one point in the New Testament, bar means son of, that's an Aramaism, we've borrowed an Aramaic word and inserted it in the Hebrew text for all sorts of different reasons. It could have just been the scribes having a bad day that day, put in your right word. There's just all sorts of different explanations for how they end up in there. And sometimes it's just later editors, or sometimes the word, the, the document's actually written later. And so that's why you have an Aramaic word. But this is a full chunk of Aramaic that shows up in Ezra in these letters back and forth between the, the people who live in Jerusalem writing to Darius, writing to Artaxerxes, and then receiving uh, receiving letters back. So they're writing to Persia, so they're writing in Aramaic because that is the the, the language of the time is is Aramaic. We're far enough past some of these um, uh, some of these kings who created new languages. So we still have we have Aramaic, Old Aramaic, Syriac. Old Persian, we kind of have a mix. Some of them actually exist today. Um, there are still people who speak Aramaic, and there are still people who speak Old Persian, and they're fairly similar. Uh, I don't know if anybody still speaks <coughs> Syriac, but it wouldn't surprise me if there's some ethnic group somewhere that uses Syriac as their main language. Um, so we, we have this kind of mix, but Aramaic is the one that really held on and even survived among the Jews, even survived through Alexander the Great, so that we have Greek as the kind of the language of the known world. But by the time you get to the time of Christ, they're still speaking Aramaic. So they know Greek. They're actually probably using a Greek version of the scriptures. They're probably using the Septuagint, because that seems to be what gets quoted the most in the New Testament. Uh, but, but they're not they're not always speaking Greek, even though they know it and even though they're willing to speak it. Um, so, you know, the, the, the Roman guards, when they arrest Paul, are actually surprised that he knows Hebrew um, because they, they thought that he was, well, they thought he was an Egyptian, and so they expected him to speak Greek. And he addresses the people in Hebrew, and they're like, oh, you're not who we thought we, you were, because you know Hebrew, so you must be a Jew. So they're at least familiar with it enough that they know it, but Aramaic was more the kind of the, the street market language, plus the new koine. But you know, Jesus cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
but he cries out in in Aramaic. He doesn't cry out in Hebrew, although it's very, very similar. Uh, lama, lama, why, why? Eli, Eli, my God, my God. That's pretty consistent with Hebrew. Sambakthani is a little, you can kind of get there through Hebrew, but it's definitely, it's definitely Aramaic. You can see the me at the end, which is me. You have abandoned me, Sambakthani. Um, but it's similar enough that you can, you, if you know Hebrew, you can kind of make out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Um, just by looking at the at that, but um, so Aramaic, um, which is really just a plug for my Aramaic class this summer. Uh, if you're interested in learning Aramaic, now I'll be honest with you, learning Aramaic is a whole lot easier if you know Hebrew. You don't have to know Hebrew in order to learn Aramaic, but it's a whole lot easier. Most people learn Hebrew first and then learn Aramaic. So to tell you that all the plurals end in a nun instead of ending in a mem, you just kind of switch them in your mind and you're done. Whereas if you don't know Hebrew, you have to actually learn it. And then when you learn Hebrew, you have to replace all the nuns with a mem, which is fine, it works, but it'll just be a little more difficult. So it doesn't mean that you have to know Hebrew uh, in order to take Aramaic, it, it's, but it won't be as intensive of a class of Aramaic this summer. We're just going to use the uh, the series. Um, I think it's by Van Pelt actually in the Zondervan series. We we'll use the video in the workbook and kind of go through it together. Um, I know enough to be dangerous, so we'll kind of let him do the teaching and uh, and I'll just moderate the class. Um, but that would at least enable you then to to learn uh, or to read Daniel and um, and parts of Ezra in the original language which if you know Hebrew, you can still do, you're just gonna have to look up every word. Whereas if you know Aramaic, you don't have to look up as much because you'll, you'll know it. You'll be familiar with some of the vocab. Um, I'm guessing, although I'm not sure, but I would assume that if you took the Aramaic class and we go through the Van Pelt book, by the end of the summer, you would know all, all the Aramaic vocabulary from Daniel and the few chapters of Ezra. Um, most of it's not that much different than, than Hebrew, which is, Nice. Uh, in fact, the letters that we use, um, you know, I said the Aramaic looks like the Hebrew. It's actually the other way around. The Hebrew looks like the Aramaic. These are Aramaic square letters, and the Hebrew is adapted, has adopted those because it's a whole lot easier to write. Is there more of a difference in the actual spoken language rather than the written? I don't think so, other than just pronunciation. Okay. Because I, I yeah. that story about them being so surprised that he spoke Hebrew and the languages are so similar to them. Yeah, I, I mean, guess there's enough of a um, of a just a vocab difference okay. um, that they they were able to tell that he's not speaking Aramaic. You know, probably similar to when somebody speaks uh, Spanish or Italian or Spanish or Portuguese. Yeah, like, mm -hmm. this is really close, but you're saying a lot of ch, and we don't have ch in Spanish, so this must be Portuguese. You know, you can kind of figure it out that way. I think it's similar with Aramaic and, and Hebrew. But again, like I said, I know enough to be dangerous. So ask me again in September, maybe I'll give you a different answer. Uh, so the, uh, the other question uh, related to the Aramaic sections is, are they authentic? Uh, and and this, is a, uh, this is a question that's been debated. In fact, I was reading an article earlier on, uh, are the Aramaic sections of Ezra reliable? And uh, it's written by a well-known scholar. I think his uh, I think his last name is Tenny, Tenny or Tani, and uh, or Tuni, something like that. And uh, I I'm familiar with the name because he's mentioned in all the commentaries. Well, then I've noticed that the date of the article is 1908. So even in 1908, they were already debating: Are the Aramaic sections authentic? Um, the one advantage that we have is that we have found a substantial amount of Aramaic writing between 1908 and today. So it, it, it's still common for a lot of scholars to say it's not authentic, these are not real letters. Um, but it's also common now because of some of the other um, documents that we've found, um, especially at uh, Elephantine, which is in uh, Northeast Egypt. We found a number of papyri there that have kind of shed light on this. We just have so many other documents to be able to see, yeah, this is, 
this is similar. I still occasionally have heard scholars say, you know, well, it doesn't quite fit how, uh, you know, how the, the, how the king or the emperor of Persia would have written. It's not quite the same. Um, and yet a number of scholars have also done work to show that if, if it wasn't, if it wasn't the emperor actually wrote the letter, it also wasn't the author of the book because there's, there's too many, um, or gaps is the right word, or seams between the sections that are inserted as letters and the rest of the book. It doesn't, it doesn't flow uh, the way that you would expect. So, but that, that's still debated. So depending on which commentary you pick up in our reading, they may say, you know, this is not an authentic letter. Um, some of those issues are, are, Some of it is, is, again, back to our historical question. Is it the exact letter that came from Artaxerxes? Well, it might be. Uh, it might not be. It might be just a synopsis of it. It might be a general account of it. It might be somebody who's recalling what was in the letter. I mean, there's a million different possibilities. Um, you know, scholars still debate the fact that Daniel talks about uh, Darius, the Mede, taking over uh, after, um, after uh, Nebuchadnezzar and, and Belshazzar, um, but it, it's not, it's Cyrus. So who's Darius? Where, there's a Darius, but he's later. So where'd Darius come from? And Scholars have often debated, you know, does, does Daniel have it wrong? Does he remember wrong? What's going on here? And there's also a million different possibilities for that one as well, that it might be that no, Daniel doesn't have it wrong. It might be there was a guy named Darius. It's possible that Cyrus's name was Darius. It's possible that it was a scribal error. I mean, there's just a million different possibilities. So some of these questions that get asked are not the end of the world when we come across them. Of, oh, no, what are we going to do? Uh, this letter doesn't seem authentic. Well, authentic means something different to us than it did than it did to them. Uh, and kind of similar to the question of you know if if there is a number that's given, which we'll talk about in just a moment here in, in Ezra and Nehemiah, if there's a number given and the number is off by one, does that mean that it's inauthentic, or do they just ballpark it? And, you know, so th those are questions that we've continued to talk about for for much of the, much of the semester. Uh, you have this document that I gave you. Uh, Tim, I emailed this to you. Um, it's, uh, um, this is actually class notes that I had from seminary. I laughed when I opened it because this is the entirety of all of the notes that I received for Ezra and Nehemiah when I was in seminary because my professor didn't think there was a whole lot to say about the book either. So, <laughs> but I, I like it because he's got this little timeline. Uh, the timeline of Ezra and Nehemiah is, um, I, I, I don't want to say that it's debated, uh, but it's, um, it's debated as to, you know, the consensus seems to be Ezra came, the book of Ezra came first, then the book of Nehemiah. And that's how they show up in, in our Bibles. Um, and so Ezra and Nehemiah uh, each, uh, each come at various times, and you can see them uh, listed there. Um, but the um, you know, phase two and phase one, uh, and then phase three. Uh, the, sometimes people will debate whether or not Nehemiah may have come first, that Ezra is later than Nehemiah as a person and as a book. Um, Sometimes I think it's just something that somebody can write a dissertation on to get the doctorate. Uh, I, it certainly has not caught on as, oh, yes, that's definitely the case. It's definitely Nehemiah than Ezra. It's just, oh, that's interesting. So, you know, it's, it's debated, but not in a, sometimes using the word debate or contested gives the idea that there's 50 people on one side and 50 people on another. And this is more like 3,000 people on one side and eight on the other. Um, so there are people who have made a lot of noise arguing for another perspective, but it certainly doesn't hold that much weight. But again, depending on what you read or hear, you're going to come across it at some point that, oh, no, 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 Ezra came second. And 
That's a theory. I don't think it's correct, but it is a, a theory. So the way that, uh, that uh, Dr. Younger has it laid out here is that there are three phases of return. And remember, we're after the exile. So the first uh, return happens in 538 BC, um, which is less than 50 years after the destruction of Jerusalem. So the 70 years is not exact. Uh, we're actually, from the time that the temple is destroyed to the time that the temple is rebuilt is actually 69 years. Almost 70. Not exactly 70. Close. Close enough that we would say it's 70. Uh, it was destroyed in 586. It's completed in 515. So 69 years. Um, the, or 71 years. Sorry, I did my math wrong there. Right? Yeah, 71 years. Um, yeah, the other way. Still close to 70. <laughs> yeah, 70. Maybe that's why Daniel was 70. Daniel's like, I'm bad at math. <laughs> yeah, so 70, 70 years, uh, Jeremiah's 70 weeks or 70 years that they're going to be, be in captivity to the, the, the Sabbath, the 10, the 10 Sabbath cycles. Um, but in 538, we have the first group that returns. Uh, Cyrus allows them to go back. Um, and his edict is recorded for us twice, once in chapter 1 in Hebrew, and then again in Ezra 6 in Aramaic as part of that. Uh, um, it's actually part of a report. They're reporting, hey, did Cyrus ever say they could go back? Well, yes, he did. Oh, okay. So then it gets re reported again. And then we have the actual return of them headed back then to, uh, to the promised land. Shesh, Shesh Bazar is the, uh, or Shesh Bazar, however you want to say his name. He is the, uh, the governor. Um, it's curious, we, we only know of three governors, um, three Israelite governors. We hear about a couple other ones. Tatnai is a governor that's mentioned at one point. But for the most part, we have just three mentioned in, in the text. We have Shesh, Shesh, Shesh Bazar or Shesh Bazar and Nehemiah. And Zerubbabel, those three are the only ones that are mentioned specifically as, as governors. We know that there's a governor because a governor is even mentioned in the book of Malachi. And we have this mentioned a couple times of other, um, other people that are, are living there. They're the governors of what is uh, the province of Yehuda, um, which becomes Judea when we Latinize it. Um, but also based off of the fact that it was the land of Judah. So that name is what gets, gets borrowed. Uh, a couple of places, it's just called the province beyond the river. It's what's west of the Jordan River, and it comprises old Israel uh, in the north, old Judah in the south, and a couple other lands there. And it's a province of the Assyrians, and, and not the Assyrians, of the Persians. It was a province of the Assyrians until Hezekiah but it's a province of the Persians. The Persians are the ones that own it. By destroying Babylon and taking over Babylon, they basically take over all of the known world that Babylon had destroyed and make it their own. And uh, the Persians actually go as far west as Greece and are stopped at Thermopylae. That's the, the end of the expansion. They are defeated. Well, they're not defeated, but they, they um, have the 300 Spartans that uh, that stop them, and then they get defeated in a military battle. If you ever seen the movie 300, or I forget what the name of the sequel is, 300 Roman or something. Yeah, I can't remember. I don't know. The second one's the naval battle that takes place, and the the Greek navy or the Persian navy is destroyed. And the Greeks solidify, and then eventually we get Alexander the Great, and he goes back the other way. They went as far west as Greece. He goes as far east as Persia and beyond and takes everything from Greece. Um, so Israel is a province of Persia and then basically becomes under Greek rule, and then a whole hodgepodge of different places once Alexander the Great dies. Then they're under the Syrians and the Seleucids, and then eventually the Romans. Um, but basically everybody takes their shot at Israel for a while between the exile and, and the time of Christ and the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD uh, by the Romans. 
uh, but you, you have right now, they're part of this province, and occasionally the ruler that we would understand as the Davidic line is the, the ruler, the governor of the province, Zerubbabel. Nehemiah is actually not part of the line of David, but he becomes the governor, so it's not a hereditary thing, but as cupbearer to the king, he's pretty high up in the Persian government. Um, you know, we think of the cupbearer as the person who, uh, you know, sips the, the wine in case the, the, uh, the, the person is being poisoned. Uh, you know, there's a cupbearer mentioned when Joseph's in prison in uh, Genesis chapter 40, I believe. Um, but that person is not just the drink guy. He's not, he's not the maid or the servant that goes and gets the, you know, hey, go get me a Diet Coke. Uh, you know, go fetch me a cup of coffee. You know, he's not the glorified secretary. He's, it's a pretty high prestigious position in actually both in, in Egypt and in Persia. You are one of the most trusted advisors of the king. Uh, you're kind of his sounding board. You're, you're there, but you're not, you're not officially one of the nobles, but you have all sorts of authority. Uh, it's an incredibly high position. So basically, when Nehemiah walks in, says, "Yeah, I'm the king's cupbearer." Well, you basically have to treat Nehemiah well because Nehemiah could just go back with his cup of wine and say, "Here you go, king." Oh, by the way, there's this guy back in uh, Israel. Can you kill him? I mean, that's the kind of clout that you have, so you don't mess with the cupbearer. So when he comes in, it makes perfect sense that he's going to be the governor because he's one of the most powerful people in all of Persia. Um, but he's not part of that Davidic line because the Persians don't really care about who's in charge of the Davidic line. Some people have tried to suggest that even Ezra was a governor. Um, it seems better to understand him as just being in charge of the religion of the province. So he does have authority, but it's a religious authority. Um, it's, not, it's not political authority. So he's not coming in as the governor, uh, although, again, people have tried to make the argument that that's what he's doing. Um, but that's, that's kind of what happens. The, the first group comes in um, under Zerubbabel, and, uh, and uh, well, Sheshbazar is there, and then the second part of this same return, at some point, um, Zerubbabel and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, who's the high priest, they come in, they build the temple from 535 until 515 B.C., they're ministered to by Haggai and Zechariah, and there's the little chart there at the bottom of the, of the page there that talks about uh, where each of them, um, where each of them falls in, in that line of prophets there. But for a time, Haggai and Zechariah overlap, um, at least right at the, right at the beginning there. Um, and Haggai is helpful because he actually dates when he prophesies, which makes it a little more convenient. The temple is finished, uh, and then we have um, some uh, craziness that goes on here. So we've got the, um, the battle on the back. You see Darius. This is Darius I, 522 BC. Uh, this is not, this is probably not the Darius mentioned by Daniel. Um, and again, lots of explanations for why Daniel has, has a different uh, temples rebuilt, and then you see it says 490, the Battle of Marathon. That's part of that Greek, uh, the Greek defeat of the Persians. Um, the Persians still hold on to power for a while, um, but eventually they're going to be defeated by Alexander the Great. Um, you get Esther and uh, Artaxerxes the first, and then you have uh, the return. Um, the seventh year of Artaxerxes Longamanus. Uh, there, are, there are two Artaxerxes, Artaxerxes I and Artaxerxes Longamanus, and scholars continue to debate how to fit it in. Um, one scholar has suggested, uh, actually this Tuni guy, suggests that they didn't have exact Persian records to base it off of. So he's not looking at a, at a book of chronicles of Persia as he's writing his account. And so that might be why there's some fluidity perhaps in the account here. But this is, uh, 
you know, we've got these names. Sometimes it almost seems the same as trying to figure out which Pharaoh Joseph took place under. Um, that's one of them. And you're kind of left with that. Of, it, it seems likely, given some of the... Um, um, some of the archaeological evidence, given some of the other evidence from Greek historians, that it is indeed Artaxerxes Longomanus, that's the one that uh, that is the the ruler when uh, Ezra and Nehemiah return. So Ezra comes in the seventh year, and then uh, Nehemiah comes in the twentieth year. Ezra comes in order to uh, take care of the religion in Israel and uh, Nehemiah comes to rebuild the walls. Uh, but that's the general, the general timeline that's taking place here. And uh, that gets us down to about 445 uh, BC. Uh, some people have suggested that Ezra is actually Malachi. Um, Malachi's name means my messenger. Um, actually, the word messenger shows up several times in, uh, in the book of, of Malachi, and it doesn't always refer to the same person. Uh, one time it's John the Baptist, one time it's Jesus Christ, and one time it's Malachi. And so the suggestion has been made that Ezra wrote Malachi. Um, the other suggestion is that Ezra wrote Ezra and Nehemiah, and that they're the, they're the same author. Um, the beginning of Nehemiah just says these are the words um, of Nehemiah. It doesn't actually say, I, Nehemiah, sat down and wrote this out. Although a lot of it is told in first person, uh, which is yeah. a little odd. There's not really another book in the Bible like that. Uh -uh. Not in it's, Old Testament. It's strange to listen to. It is. Um, the, what kind of muddies the waters even more is that tradition up until those Septuagint said that Ezra and Nehemiah were read together, or read as one book. Uh, each of the uh, each of the books of the Bible has some notes that have been put at the end of it by the Masoretes, how many letters are in the book. Usually there's some sort of, of blessing that's uh, indicated at the end of the book. It'll tell you what the middle letter is of the whole book. Uh, you know, this word is the exact middle of the book of Isaiah, and it's found in Isaiah, you know, chapter 37, verse 12, word 2. That's the exact middle of the book. Well, there isn't that after Ezra. It shows up after Nehemiah, but it refers to Ezra and Nehemiah, and almost views them as, as one book. Uh, and so oftentimes, um, oftentimes it's suggested that these were indeed one book, which the fact that it says these are the words of Nehemiah, it's really one guy writing it, and he just says these are the words of Nehemiah. We have at the end of Proverbs, these are the words of King Lemuel that his mother taught him. So it, it's not unique in the Old Testament to have, have somebody writing that. What is unique is the first person account. The only other time that we have that is Moses. And it's not consistent in Deuteronomy. Um, only within the first probably four chapters does he talk in the first person and not always. So Nehemiah, for him to talk in the first person and to, to utter these prayers in the middle of it is, is unique. So a lot of people have said, okay, we have one author who's put the books together, but it's multiple writers, and that they're collecting these different documents, these different words, and putting them together to form a book. And then from the Greek version, the Septuagint on, it became common just to split them in two and have Ezra and Nehemiah divided. Um, so there is ongoing debate uh, of that. In some ways, the division doesn't really matter as we're, as we're reading Ezra and Nehemiah, as long as we remember the two go closely together. Of when you have Ezra, you have Nehemiah. When you have Nehemiah, you have Ezra. And the two, the two are so closely related, they probably shouldn't be separated to any large degree um, any more than we would divide 1st and 2nd Samuel or 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Uh, the question, though, about who wrote it, um, we still don't know. Might have been Ezra. Um, for a while, and maybe even still is the case, it was assumed that the chronicler wrote it, that he wrote the book of Chronicles and wrote Ezra and Nehemiah, or that Ezra wrote Ezra and Nehemiah and wrote Chronicles. Uh, so you, you, those are kind of the main, the main candidates that are thrown out there are Ezra, chronicler, 
maybe Nehemiah. Um, you've got these people that are are suggested, but honestly, at the end of the day, we don't we don't really know. Um, I guess one question that I was thinking about this week, as I was thinking about this this class tonight, is okay. We've got these books, Ezra and Nehemiah, and I've pretty much told you all there is to know about Ezra and Nehemiah. <laughs> so does that make these books insignificant? Um, I mean, what do you say about Ezra and Nehemiah? Yep, they came back. Yay. Um, and, I, and I think sometimes we can give that impression that because there's not a lot to say about it, that it's just not that important of a book. You know? Esther. Yeah, we all know the story. Be like Esther. Such a time as this. <laughs> Yay. Go Esther. Um, you know, Esther, the, the Dead Sea Scrolls don't have Esther because the people that lived at Qumran hated the book of Esther. <laughs> so, okay. Because, you know, she creates a festival that's not found in, in Deuteronomy. So, therefore, you know, that apostate Esther, Esther, we gotta get rid of her. Um, so, you know, but what do you do with a book like that of, yeah, you know, you just mentioned it in Sunday school, hey, you book Esther, you know, what, what do you do with it? And, and I think it's, a, it's an unfair, unfortunate impression that we give. You can probably put Ruth in the same category, or uh, Nahum, or Obadiah, or it's not big, it's not long, it's not terribly complicated. What you think it means, that's pretty much what it means. So why even have it? And uh, yeah, that, I think that's one of the bigger questions. Um, and again, not really something you put in the lecture as much as, as a discussion of why even have such a tiny, seemingly random and significant book as Ezra and Nehemiah. I was trying to pick up on, I don't know, I mean, you know, in scripture is the easy answer. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, um, but I was trying to pick up on some of the themes, you know, like what, it, what mm -hmm. is it trying to say? Because I haven't spent much time in these books at all. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, it's interesting that they're, I felt like reading them they like fall kind of flat <laughs> yes like after reading kings and chronicles uh -huh. it's like uh, <laughs> that's kind of uh -huh. not a great time mm -hmm. um so yeah i don't i don't know mm -hmm. um yeah i also thought <clears throat> it was significant at the beginning of ezra um you know, they begin to rebuild the temple. They sing responsibly to the Lord, uh, praising and giving thanks to the Lord for he is good and the steadfast love endures forever toward Israel, which I hadn't mm -hmm. remembered hearing elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost like, like they want David and Solomon back. Yeah. Uh -huh. But then the prophets are saying, we're going to the whole, like the ends of the earth. Right. And I don't know, it's almost like they're missing. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think you're definitely you're definitely picking up maybe not necessarily the um, the intentional message mm -hmm. as much as the implicit message. Mm -hmm. It's hard to cover up how much life in Israel stinks at this point, especially when you remember what they had. Right. You know, we were you know just a few. You know, less than a hundred years prior to this, they were one of the, the you know the leading powers on earth. They had uh, they had an alliance with Egypt. They had an alliance with Babylon. Um, you know, they had had uh, they had Josiah. They had this huge religious reform. Um, you know, the, the purity of Israel was being kind of refocused. Um, then you have Isaiah and Jeremiah that are both making these great prophecies as to what's going to happen. After the return, you know, the righteous remnant is going to return. Uh, we're going to have the 70 years, and then there's going to be this return to the Holy Land. You're going to have, you know, the law of God written on their hearts. You're going to have the Spirit of God being poured out on them. You're having, um, you know, the heart of stone is going to be taken and given the heart of flesh. Uh, God's going to make a new covenant. I mean, it sounds 
fairly encouraging. It just doesn't happen. Oh. And yeah, and, and so you can see why as much as, as we try in a way to put a good face on it, there's not really a good face to put on it. So on the one hand, you do have this reminder of the faithfulness of God, which is why you can't just go straight from, okay, we had the exile, we had some prophets, and then we had Jesus. You have to have a return at some point, and you have to have a rebuilding of the temple at some point as a confirmation that God's covenant does continue. Um, that's especially true in Haggai of the Davidic covenant continues with Zerubbabel, of the branch, as he's called. Um, you have the prophecies in Zechariah referring to um, uh, both the line of kings and the line of priests being the branch. Um, I'm sorry, Haggai is uh, not the branch, the signet ring, I think is what he's called. Um, so you, you've got these Davidic prophecies that are being given to Zerubbabel, who then ceases to exist and is never heard from again. And some people have said, maybe Haggai thought he was going to do all this, and he was wrong. But Zerubbabel vanishes. You know, tradition says he was taken back to, to Babylon and dies in prison. Um, we, we just don't know. He just kind of up and disappears. and doesn't become anything significant. Um, so, you know, we had all these high hopes. Build the temple. The glory of God's going to fill the temple. The glory yet to come is going to be greater than anything that has come before. Um, you know, all the nations on earth are going to bring their treasures into this temple. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to not happen now. And so you, you're kind of left with all of these, I, I, I want this, this longing for this glorious return, this longing for this righteous remnant that Isaiah spoke of, the longing for the new covenant, the longing for the pouring out of the Spirit of God, and there's not. In fact, there's 500 years of not. Um, they're going to get invaded multiple times uh, by various peoples. Um, they're going to have horrific rulers. They're going to have, you know, the, the closest that they come to a glorious time is about 150, 180 years before Christ. You have the, uh, the Maccabean revolt that takes place, and they set up the Hasmonean dynasty where the Levites become the kings for about a hundred years. Um, and Herod marries the last, he marries the last living Hasmonean, he marries the daughter. Um, so, you know, the, aside from that, it's pretty dull. So you've kind of got both and. You've got, isn't this great, we're returning, look at all these thousands of people that are coming back from exile. God is faithful. And yet you've also got the, oh, this is awful. And so the picture of the men standing there weeping as they're seeing the foundation of the temple, it's about the temple, but I think it's just about life in general, of, yeah, this is great. This is fantastic. We're rebuilding the temple. God is faithful. This is terrible. This temple is nothing like the last one. It's not more glorious than the last one. It's a shell of its former self. It's even bigger than the last one but it's still not as glorious. It's not one of the wonders of the ancient world. It's not overlaid in gold. Um, you know, some people have suggested that some of, the, some of the rubble that was left from the original temple, like the stone works and stone foundations and some of those things, that those are actually incorporated into the second temple. Um, and there is precedent for that. That's how you establish... Um, continuity between buildings, which you had to have at least one brick from the first house into the second one or the first temple to the second temple. So they probably had at least one, but it's possible they even just reused a lot of the stuff that was there. But again, you're standing there just remembering, especially if you're an adult, you're remembering the glory of Solomon's temple and how wonderful it was. <clears throat> and you're recognizing this is not the same. But it wasn't I mean, the temple was wonderful. Mm -hmm. I think that's what struck me reading it is being in ministry in a time of the winnowing and shrinking of the visible church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It made me really feel sorry for the leaders here because 
they come back, they're sent back for a specific purpose, and they have this big group. And they are still running into men who are causing contention and causing headaches and want power and want leadership. And then you've got the people who are whining about this and whining about that and spending more time on their houses than the temple. Mm -hmm. And they're whining about the temple. It's not as glorious. And don't we need David? And don't we need Solomon? It's like, no. The problem isn't with your leaders, y'all. The problem is you guys. Mm -hmm. So Solomon's temple was wonderful. Y'all still sucked back then. And that's why you're here now. Uh -huh. And you're doing it all over again. So... A lot of it to me was just the patience and almost the holy slowness of God as he patiently deals with a people that just don't get it. Mm -hmm. And this is their doing. And, you know, you, you read Ezra and, and Nehemiah and you think, well, this is kind of boring. <laughs> you feel sorry for the faithful people who were there because it was kind of boring. Mm -hmm wasn't the good old days, it wasn't the glory days, and yet they're still trying to be faithful with what little that is left, and they're getting beaten on every single side. Mm -hmm. And they continue like that. I mean, to me, it's it was an encouraging read, not necessarily the most exciting, but... Mm -hmm. I think it definitely, it's an encouragement to the elect now, even mm -hmm. so, that God is faithful to us in our slowness, mm -hmm. in our dullness. Yeah. And, he works in his own timing. Mm -hmm. And I thought, in contrast to what we came out of in yeah. Samuel and Chronicles, in, in these, you see the glimmer of, well, God has established faithful leaders now. Right. And there are there is some people in Israel mm -hmm. now, in contrast to the, oh, yeah, we're just going to go after the, the Baals and the, mm -hmm. the Asherah every other week. <laughs> it's yeah. like now there is a faithful remnant who, in spite of what the people say around them, they're going to follow God. Yeah. Yeah, it's something that we don't think about very often, but had the exile not happened, Jesus would not have been crucified. Because had Jesus shown up during the reign of Manasseh and said, I'm God, you have to listen to me, I think the people would have been like, yeah, okay, sure, why not? What's one more? We'll just add you to the group. You know, and so you know, the fact that you have a group of religious leaders who are absolutely terrified that somebody's being blasphemous, yes, they're politically motivated, but there is a spiritual element to it as well. They're concerned. They're concerned for their country. They're thinking, if he comes in here and convinces a bunch of people to go and follow him, rather than follow the one true God, we're in trouble. We're in big trouble because people are gonna uh, people are gonna follow after him, and God's gonna judge us again and send us off into exile again. So, you know, in the same with um, you know, Antiochus Epiphanes, he comes in and he offers a pagan puts a pagan image on the altar. Um, some sources say he offers a pig on the altar. You know, he does all this stuff um, to to desecrate the temple. And he actually asks a, um, he asks a priest, uh, Jacob Maccabeus, asks him to offer up sacrifices to this pagan image. And Maccabeus says, no, I won't do it. And so uh, Tychus Epiphanes says, okay. So he turns to the next priest and says, you do it. And that priest says, okay, I'll do it. And so as he gets ready to offer the sacrifice, Jacob Maccabeus just kills him. He says, not my temple. Well, that sparks the whole Maccabean revolt, and you know they end up driving the Syrians out of out of the out of Palestine. But yeah, but none of that would have happened, you know, if even if it was during the reign of of some of these kings in Israel. Of hey, I'm going to offer this on the altar. Yeah, whatever. You know, I mean, you know, guy comes right from Damascus. Hey, I saw this really cool pagan altar. We should put that in our temple. Yeah, sure, I'll get right on it. So, you know, it would have fit right in, but because of the exile and because of this, um, this getting of their attention, it got their attention to the point that they won't even accept Christ. And actually, to this day, I think there's still a fear on the part of a lot of Jews. Um, we have to be holy or God's not going to come and save us, and, which is a lot of pressure on the one hand, 
But on the other hand, it's also because of the exile. So the events that we're reading about here, they continue to have an effect some 2,500 years later because they still think we have to earn it. Uh, there's debate among the Jews as to whether or not God ever returned to the second temple because there was no visible cloud. And originally my dissertation was going to be trying to explain the Holy Spirit was the cloud, is the cloud, which I still believe is not what I'm writing on. But, uh, but they wouldn't understand that, although I think because of Haggai they were supposed to, but they, they don't think that. They just, a lot of them just think God never came back. He abandoned us in Babylon and that was the end. And sure, we built the second temple, but we had Persian help. So it's, uh, it, it is, um, it's impure. We had Herod. Herod had a lot to do with the second temple. So it's impure. So it's not a true temple. So God has rejected it. He never came back. And he's never come back and never will come back until we are somehow holy enough. Um, which is sad, but it all, all goes back to the exile. So the fact that you have two books written on no, the exile is over, and yet at the same time, it's not over. It is, but it isn't. It's ending, but it's going to take hundreds of years to fully end. So that when Jesus goes to Egypt and returns from Egypt, Matthew says, out of Egypt I called my son. Okay. Now the exile is ending, but you still have that kind of continuing up until the time of Christ, some 500 years. And it makes a huge impact on the people as 500 years, 400, 300 of it with no profit, getting invaded time and time again. So it's, yay, we're rejoicing, we're back, and yet... We got all these problems and those problems continue. They don't go away. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's frustrating for them. Very frustrating. Yeah, both Ezra and later in Nehemiah too, they say like we are slaves. Mm -hmm. Which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. Calling back to Egypt. Yes. You know, like they're in the land, but oh yeah, they're still. Yep. Yeah, they're not independent. Right. They have to answer to the king of of Persia or the emperor of Persia. So yeah, it's uh, it's depressing. Yeah. For lack of a better word, it's very depressing. So it's encouraging and depressing. So we have this we have this continuity of Israel. Israel continues. That's great. We also have a eh, it's not the same. So encouraging and discouraging all at the same time. So we have to have Ezra and Nehemiah as almost a I don't want to say a midpoint, but as a we're progressing towards Christ. But it, it kind of leaves it on a bit of a cliffhanger of Nehem, Ezra and Nehemiah coming after the book of Chronicles um, in terms of chronology. But that means that you kind of end on a, on a low note if it's the last book of the Bible. Um, you end on this low note of, well, we're back, I guess. And some of the issues that show up in Ezra show up again in Nehemiah. That you have this issue with the uh, intermarrying with foreign wives in Ezra, and then some however many years later, some 20 years later, you end up with them still having the same issue with, with Nehemiah. They're still marrying foreign wives, foreign women. And uh, you know, you just kind of it, it, it can be depressing, and then you go on to Malachi, and they're offering diseased animals on the altar, and they're you know, whining, is it worth it, and what's the point, and you know, I think that's part of why people say Ezra wrote Malachi, is that Malachi, the tone, the tenor fits in very well with the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, yay, maybe. 
<laughs> We're rebuilding, rebuilding the walls. Hey, this is fantastic. Sort of. Hey, we're we're doing we're doing this, but it's not it's not as wonderful as it was. So there's good, there's bad, and there's ugly. And it, it is all there uh, in in Ezra and, and Nehemiah. So if you were to uh, if you were to preach through Ezra and Nehemiah or to teach through Ezra or Nehemiah, how would you explain to the people that you're ministering to what is this book trying to communicate? I'm working on like themes of like Exodus and the temple and the kings and typological things like that from that kids and stuff. Uh, seeing a lot of the same things in Ezra and Nehemiah was actually really exciting. For me. Mm -hmm. So I've like, worked out a ton of stuff as I was doing this. But yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's really cool seeing the way that some of those things work in, but are different than they were in the past. Mm -hmm. like one thing I'm trying to understand about this is the relationship between Israel and the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So you see kind of a, at least the way I think about these, you see kind of a progressive, like Israel's Continually slowly progressing towards the, the time when those um, barriers are broken down. Mm -hmm. And you kind of you see traces of that through the Old Testament, I guess. And that a lot of it happens with the building of new temples. Mm -hmm. So, like Solomon built a temple with art from the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And then Isaiah prophesies that God is going to rebuild the temple and, and the art from the, the Gentiles is going to beautify the house of the Lord, is what he says. And then, mm -hmm. then when Cyrus donates all of this stuff from the temple that Ezra says, I praise the Lord that he put this into the heart of the king to beautify the house mm -hmm. of the Lord, using almost the same phrase that I say, right? Uses. And so you kind of see more of that. Mm -hmm. And then when they celebrate the Passover, um, they even, like, it says that you know, people who wanted to free themselves from the impurity of the nations came and worshiped God and joined them with their Passover. Mm -hmm. So there's that, but then the end of the book focuses kind of on the opposite. It's mm -hmm. uh, emphasizing the need to not intermarry with the other right. kingdoms, and that seems a little bit strange, but, but so it seems like kind of that theme is working in both directions, mm -hmm. and that's really interesting to me, but um, just the way that, the, that those themes are continually, I, I think these books show ways that kind of in unnoticed ways, Israel is continually progressing to the time when Christ can come mm -hmm. in an interesting way. So I think that's, that's what kind of makes me excited to read this. I don't really know much, mm -hmm. much about how to contextualize that, but yeah, I, I see a lot of stuff in that that makes me. Right. But, yeah, Ezra and Nehemiah should, there should be a, almost a longing for more. Yeah as you're finishing the books of we're back, but we're not back. So we're still, we're still waiting for something. We don't know what it is. Not this, but yet it's kind of this. So something's happened. We're back. We're living in Jerusalem. There's people from almost every tribe. You know, we talked about the lost 10 tribes, but you know, People from all the tribes are mentioned as in living in Jerusalem. So, you know, there's a remnant that returns, not a huge remnant, but there are people that return from the deportation to Assyria. They come back and they live in Jerusalem. So, you know, we've got to return. We don't have two tribes anymore, and we have one. And Zechariah really emphasizes that um, about the two staffs becoming one, that Judah and Israel have become one again. And yet, at the same time, we do have this continual longing for a king. And so you're, you're seeing kind of the, it, it, it's almost a, um, it's almost an Old Testament version of already, but not yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was going to ask if it would be no. appropriate to draw some parallels between the church age and the uh -huh. like, I don't know, if you were to preach it, would that be? I, I would say yes, uh, in, in just because it fits. Mm -hmm. of, we're, we're thrilled for what we have. We've, we've been let out of Egypt. We're, you know, I, I think it's similar to, um, you know, we're in the promised land. Yay. Oh, no, we have judges. 
Right. So, you know, we got 400 years of judges. This isn't what we signed up for. We want a king. Hey, we got a king. This is great. Oh, no. Now we're in exile. Hey, we're back. And, oh, no. Now we got a governor. So, you know, the, there's always this longing for, in the judge period, they longed for David. In the whole period of the kings, they wanted to go back to David. And then we have the exile, and they want to go back to the promised land, and now they want David. So there's this continual emphasis on we're looking for the right guy, and we haven't found him yet. And even when we had him, he got a bunch of us killed. <laughs> so, you know, it, it was great when we had him, but he wasn't even perfect. So we're longing for something, but we can't really put our finger on it. I think the difference is we know what we're longing for. And over time, they came to understand what they were longing for because the prophets told them if they were paying attention. But clearly, clearly some people were paying attention because Simeon and Anna and a number of other people were fully aware of what it was that was being prophesied. And they connected the dots. Matthew connected the dots for us. Luke connected the dots for us. No, there was definitely a connection between what the prophets were saying you have the messenger that was going to come before that great and dreadful day of the Lord, the, the, the messenger of Elijah and John the Baptist, and, you know, make way, the, the, make straight the paths of the Lord. I mean, that was all coming, and they're longing for that. And each time a prophet talks about it, they long for it even more. It just doesn't happen. And so it's, we're longing for this. We have some of it. We've been liberated. We're back. But... It's not as glorious as we had hoped. Um, and and I, I, think that's, I think that's a very good explanation and description of what we see in the church age today. That already but not yet. Of, we're liberated. Death is conquered. Sin is conquered. We still live here. Um, you know, I, I was talking to somebody yesterday about uh, just relationships and how, yeah, relationships are a risk and sometimes you get burned and that's hard and it makes you never want to have relationships again. And yet there is a part of us that needs to recognize that person really hurt me in this relationship. And I feel very wounded by that. And yet... I'm as upset as I am of what happened. I recognize I'm going to be with that person for eternity. And so there's, there's almost a, look, it sucks. You just stabbed me in the back. You, you know, you betrayed me. You, I mean, whatever description you want to use of all the things that you did to hurt me, that I will carry that wound with me until I die. And yet looking past that to... You are my brother or sister in Christ, and I'm going to spend eternity with you in a perfect relationship. And so it breaks my heart what our relationship has become now, and yet recognizing that for eternity, our relationship will be perfect. And I long for that. Sometimes, depending on who it is that stabbed me in the back, I wonder if they're actually going to be there in eternity. <laughs> But at the same time, if I if they are, then I know, okay, this relationship is going to continue for forever. But it sucks right now. I mean, it's terrible. Um, yay, Christ has defeated sin and death, and that person just stabbed me in the back. So, great. Good news for the gospel. I don't feel very great right now. But, but yet, yeah, recognizing that, yeah, okay. So, the same thing with Ezra of you know, laying in the temple all night or laying in the house of God all night and just crying out to God of, did these people not get this? We just spent 70 years in exile because we intermarried with foreign women and worshiped foreign gods. And now we're back and we're worshiping, you know, we're intermarrying with foreign women. We haven't worshiped other gods yet, but we're still doing the same thing that got us down that path in the first place. And Ezra's like, are you people just dumb? What's wrong with you people? And so, you know, you can understand his frustration of, oh, I thought we were past this. And recognizing, well, no, we still, we still live in a sinful, fallen world, and there's still pain, and there's still agony. But Ezra is longing for that future. The prophets, says Peter, are longing for that future. Zerubbabel is longing for that future. They're all looking forward to it. 
but to a degree, we're all looking forward to it too. We have it more than they did. They were longing for Christ, but now we're in that spot of, okay, we've returned from exile, as it were, but it's not perfect. We're not necessarily slaves, but it kind of feels that way. You know, we're not, um, you know, we're not living in the nation of Israel. Even people who live in Israel right now don't live in Israel because that Israel doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, unless you live in the city of Jerusalem, uh, most people in Israel don't really care. They're pretty secular. Uh, so, you know, okay. I thought this was going to be great. <laughs> and it's not. Um, so, yeah, in that sense, Ezra and Nehemiah is a perfect book for the church age. Of It was bad. It got better. But the best is yet to come. And doesn't always, um, it, in some ways, it's almost not comforting. You know, wow, this really sucks. Yeah, it sucks for them too. Yeah, well, great. Now there's three of us that are, you know, I was depressed. Now there's two of us. Great. So that makes me feel better. But at the same time, recognizing that, yes, but, you know, they waited 500 years and then Christ came. And we're waiting for the same thing. So what they waited for and what they were longing for in the midst of that, they eventually got. And we know what they were longing for. And I think the one encouragement for us is we know what we're longing for. We know what we're hoping for. And we know it's coming. When I was reading Martin, sorry, just being a Jew at that time. Mm -hmm. just reading Exodus and kind of got the sense not Exodus, Ezra, uh, and kind of got the as bad as things are, there is real growth. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Ezra is weeping over the sins, he talks about how evil the sin is, and the people seem to get it, uh -huh. like for the first time yep. ever. And the response of the leaders is amazing to me. They're like, yes, we've sinned, there's hope. Uh -huh. And they take the initiative in setting up that covenant that for the first time, I think, that I've noticed in the mm -hmm. Old Testament, the people take the initiative rather than the people, yes. rather than like the priestly mm -hmm. leader. And there's that. I also had a question. It seems like, well, maybe to use a very evangelical phrase, it seems like Israel has a closer relationship with God at this point. Mm -hmm. I know this talk of the hand of God is everywhere. Mm -hmm. That's right. Like anytime anyone does anything worth mentioning, says they, they were successful in this because the hand of God was on them. Mm -hmm. It's a point of the eye of God being on someone. There's all this kind of anthropomorphic language to describe God's mm -hmm. influence or nearness with them. Yeah. In a way that I haven't noticed. I don't, I don't know. I, mean, mm -hmm. I know that there's used other times, but it seems like it's used much more often mm -hmm. here. So mm -hmm. like what's what's going on with that? Is that like a real thing think, or is, it, is it kind of well I think it's a real theme yeah. and I think it's that they're it, almost in some ways they they just don't have a choice yeah. you know it's not like they can say okay we know what takes place in Israel is the work of God because that's his Messiah that's his anointed one that's his king and so he does things yeah it's like God does it now it's well, no, we don't have, we don't have this direct person anymore. So now we're seeing God in other ways that maybe we didn't focus on before. So you know, the hand of God moves Cyrus and moves Artaxerxes and moves these other other kings, other rulers, other people moves them to actually uh, do things rather than just okay, there is a person who is the agent of God. And that's who God works through. That person's missing. So it's almost like now they're looking for, for other things. Yeah. Um, and so some of it might even just be a reaction to um, the, the, the circumstances. We have to look elsewhere because there is no Messiah to look, to look at and say he's doing everything through his agent. There is no agent. Um, I, I've always found it fascinating that in, uh, in Isaiah, one of the people who is called the Messiah and one of the people who is called the servant of God is Cyrus. Yeah. 
And uh, that's, that's an often forgotten fact that Cyrus is referred to as God's anointed and as God's servant. Just a few chapters later, the same language is used of, of the suffering servant of Christ. Right. But it's used of Cyrus. And uh, you know, that's, that's pretty significant. I don't know that Cyrus knew that. Um, you know, sometimes Cyrus, at least in the Hebrew Bible, talks like, um, like he truly believes in God. Uh, we know from other archaeological evidence that he did the same thing that he did for Israel, he did for other nations. He also sent them home and rebuilt their temples. That was just something he did. Um, and his, Cyrus's son was very big on rebuilding temples um, to the point that that's all he did and that's what lost him the kingdom because he was too busy building temples and actually rule and reign. Um, but yeah, God is using these other, these other people as his Messiah, because there is no Messiah, there is no, you know, there is no direct king. Cyrus is the one doing the healing things that David knows. Yes, it's like he he has Ezra set up like priests and make sure mm-hmm. follows the law and the judges and all that. Right. Yes, that it's a very fascinating theme in Ezra and in uh, in um, in even Nehemiah and in uh, in Isaiah. That Cyrus is doing this, and then Artaxerxes tells Ezra, "Yeah, go back and teach them the law." And part of it's like, "Who are you? <laughs> you're not yeah, in charge. Why does it care that people? Yeah, you're not even an Israelite. Yeah. You know, that, that's just weird. But you know, that's what he does. He he sends Ezra. Yeah, yeah, go back, and I want to put you in charge of the religion. Some of it may have been, um, and and." It's always hard to tell in terms of the mindset of an ancient people. You, you don't want to go too far and be like, oh yeah, this is definitely how they thought. But sometimes they thought in terms of local deities. So that if you were going to Israel, you needed to have somebody who knew the Israelite God. Mm-hmm. Because you wanted the Israelite, the local deity, to bless yeah. to bless that area. And I think he kind of says that. Yeah. Because um, we see that even... In um, the Philistines, I think are a good example of you know they come with their goddess, and there's debate over who exactly she is. But they come with her, and then it seems like they just try everybody because they worship Dagon for a time, who's not he's not from that area of of of, uh, of the ancient Near East. He's from more northeast. They bring him in. They worship Asherah. They worship Baal. They were, I mean, it seems like every time you turn around, the Philistines are worshiping somebody different. And I think some of it is they're trying to figure out which one works. And I think that's what Israel does. Israel says, God got us out of Egypt. He led us through the wilderness. But now we're in, in the promised land. Now we're in Canaan. So you need to worship a Canaanite God. Because God's mountain is Horeb or Sinai, but that's that way. We don't live there. We live here. So the crops fail. We need to find the local God. The local God is a Canaanite God. must be a Baal. So we'll worship the Baals. The nice thing, though, that you see when they come back after returning from, uh, from Babylon is that now they're beginning to realize, oh, wait a minute. God's not just the God of Israel. He's a national God, so that an event that happens in Babylon, we can say, is by the hand of God. And Ezekiel really emphasized that. Um, and I, I've, I've almost, uh, well, it's not just me, but it's some of the research that I did on Haggai before I switched topics suggested that there's almost this, this new exodus that takes place. The cloud, the glory cloud of God leaves the temple but when it leaves, it goes to Babylon because it's next to the Kebar River in Babylon is where Ezekiel sees the wheels turning on the wheels and the four figures. And, and he sees what looks very much like Sinai. He sees the, the blue sapphire glass that's under the feet of God. And he, you know, he sees what looks like the, uh, the chariot of God, which became really big in Kabbalah, in, in mysticism, the Merkaba. Um, a uh, a Merkaba is just a chariot, but the, the 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 chariot of God basically is what he's seeing. Well, then the temple gets destroyed, 
and God's not in it, but then he has a vision of a new temple and the cloud takes them from Babylon from the east, takes them west into, uh, into Jerusalem and refills the temple. And then Ezekiel almost acts like Moses. He appoints the Levites and has laws and commandments. And it sounds almost like they're just restarting over. Of Okay, now we've got this, uh, this new exodus that's taking place as he, as he comes in back to the, this new rebuilt temple, which in literal interpretation is what I think the Jews were hoping for. They were hoping to actually see the cloud of God fill this. But it's almost like he's, he's redoing the exodus to say, I'm the God who no longer led you out of Egypt. I'm the God who led you out of Assyria and Babylon. And that that almost becomes the the parallel of Egypt. Yeah. So when Hosea says, "Out of Egypt, I called my son." Yeah. He's kind of talking about Egypt, but he's really talking about Assyria. Hmm. Yeah, because that's kind of, I mean, harkening back to the beginning of God calling Abraham. Uh huh. You know, like it's. Oh no, taking the Pentateuch class. Mm -hmm. It's that high priest coming from being exiled east of Eden coming. Mm -hmm. Deeper into the Holy of Holies, moving west, going up the mountain of God. It's yep. That same. Yeah, and the same picture. picture is there. Yeah. And which I think is part of why it somewhat falls flat with Israel, because that's what they expected to see. Right. And they don't see it right. with their eyes. Yeah, it's all that built up expectation. Yeah. But I think that's why, in my opinion, Haggai says. Just like I covenanted with you at Sinai, my spirit is in your midst. As though to say, okay, you don't see the cloud, but the cloud for all intents and purposes is here in the form of the spirit. I am in your midst. But now you got to take a word for it. Now you're not seeing it. You built the temple, so the symbol is there, but you're not going to see an actual filling of the temple. Um, you're not really going to see a filling of the temple until Pentecost. And then you see a filling of the temple in that sense mm -hmm. as the spirit descends on the apostles. Um, so you, you see all of these kind of strands start to come together a little bit more through the prophets and through Ezra and Nehemiah, but they're still, they're closer, but they're not quite connected yet. Um, you know, you mentioned the idea of, of the nations, and that's another thing that has always fascinated me. You know, I, 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 like the, um, I like the imagery of warfare in the Old Testament, uh, and just that imagery of if you are not an Israelite, you are part of the kingdom of Satan. It's just very black and white. So on... On day, you know, if we're counting down, you know, from day three to day two to day one, leading up to the resurrection. So it's it's the day, you know, let's say it's uh, it, it's it's that Thursday. It's Monday, Thursday. We're in the garden. The temple servant comes up to arrest Jesus, and Peter is thinking, "You are a Gentile, and you are part of the kingdom of Satan. I must kill you." And so he pulls out his sword and he cuts off Malchus's ear. Because how dare you? Now, I don't know about you. How he managed to cut off an ear, Peter is really bad with a sword or really good with a sword. I'm guessing really bad. That's my guess. I don't think he was aiming for the ear. But he cuts off the guy's ear. And Jesus says, no, no, no. And then, a few weeks later, says, so you need to go convert him. Malchus is no longer your enemy. He was then. He was an instrument of Satan. He was part of the kingdom of darkness. He was a Gentile. He was unclean. He was everything you thought he was, but not now. So I'm in three days, but now he's not. Now I have risen from the dead, and now you need to go make disciples, all nations. So Malchus now needs to be converted. The high priest needs to be converted. The priests need to be converted. The Romans need to be converted. The Gentiles need to be converted. So now all of these enemies of God are suddenly not enemies of God. Now they're pre-Christians, 
you know, they're, they're, they're potential Christians or whatever name you want to use. So that, yeah, you've almost got this kind of both and in Ezra and Nehemiah of we're, we're waiting for the ingathering of the nations. Just don't you dare marry them. Right. <laughs> so they can come. They can give all the offerings they want in the temple. We will take their money. We will rebuild the temple. This is great. This is glorious. Just don't marry them. So it, it's kind of this, this kind of both and not yet of we have to have purity. We can't intermix with the Samaritans. And, and unfortunately, I think some of that hatred of the Samaritans has its roots in Ezra and Nehemiah. For good reason, the Samaritans are kind of pains in the butt in Ezra and Nehemiah and mess with them a lot with Sambalat and Tapnai and all these various other people that create a hard time for them. There's also seems to be a big push, of, especially as part of Nehemiah, against the Samaritans. And that even when you come back from Babylon, you have to be able to show that you are descended from Jews, even to the point that one of the uh, one of the people that's mentioned, um, I forget which name it was. I thought I had written it down somewhere. Um, Start with a B. Oh yeah, it's like. Oh. He's, he's not, he doesn't list his dad's name because he doesn't know his dad's name. He lists his father-in-law's name, which is very unique. That you just, he didn't really do that. Barzillai? Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah, you don't really mention, you don't, the line doesn't go to your father-in-law. You're not related to him. Right. But they had to be connected to somebody, and so... He's basically saying, look, all my descendants are connected to that guy. And so that almost becomes the family line then is I'm going to connect you through that guy so that your, your ethnic purity, as it were, is there. Um, so it's just this fascinating kind of the prepping and the progressive, we're getting ready, but uh, not yet. So it, it yeah, it, it, it's almost... I don't know. It, it, the closer you get to the time of Christ, the harder it is to keep those categories distinct. Yeah. Of, of um, you know, I, I was I was actually uh, years ago. Um, I was talking to Michelle about a, a couple that I had been doing premarital counseling for. This was probably I don't know, probably been six or seven years, and I said, you know, really, when it comes to sex, it's really bizarre. Because we tell people, no, 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 no. They get married. Yes, 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 yes. So, you know, 30 minutes ago, no. Now, yes. So before, this is wrong. You can't do this. Now, if you don't do this, this is wrong. You have to do this. So it's just, it just switches like that. I mean, it's the only thing I can really think of in terms of our, of our understanding of the way that Yesterday it was this way. Now Christ has died and risen again, so now it's this way. Now it's completely different. So yesterday, you could not marry a Gentile. Today, not only do you have to marry them, you have to convert them. You need to have godly children by them, and you need to send your godly children to other places so that they can carry the message to them too. But yesterday it was bad. Yesterday, no, nope, can't, can't do that. And, and you know, especially if you were a Jew at the time of Christ, I mean, just kind of wrapping your mind around the various changes that would have taken place, most of which we take for granted. Um, well, of course, you don't have to be circumcised to be a believer. I mean, come on, what kind of stupid idea is that? Well, yesterday you did. Yesterday, if you were a convert, you had to be circumcised. Today, you don't. Yesterday, we could baptize you what we want. It didn't mean anything. In fact, if you were baptized yesterday, before Christ rose from the dead, today, we're actually going to re-baptize you because yesterday was John's baptism and today is Jesus' baptism. So everything has changed between circumcision and the dietary laws and all this stuff has changed in a mere number of hours. Of, it was the Passover. We celebrated the Passover together last night. Monday, Thursday. Now I'm dying on the cross. You never have to celebrate Passover again. Because now it has a whole new meaning. 
Now you're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper literally for eternity. So, you know, uh, just the transformation that takes place, but the closer we get to the time of Christ, the more you see this, um, you know, even in Zechariah, let's make it a crown, let's put it on the head of, Zech or, uh, of Joshua, the son of Jehoshadak, the high priest, and declare that he is the branch, using a Davidic term, you are the branch, now give me back the crown, and we're going to put it in storage. And you can just picture Joshua being like, I thought that was my crown. No, nope, no, nope. you're, just, you're just a symbol. When the guy who needs it, needs it, we'll have it ready for him, but it's not you. But you are, you're the branch, but you're not. You know, so I, I think you are seeing that in Ezra and Nehemiah. You're seeing this. We're getting closer. Um, to the point that sometimes when I read Nehemiah, there's a part of me that wants to say, yeah, who cares? Who cares about the wall? Right, yeah. It almost feels like the whole thing is futile. Yes. Like, why are we worried about who we're marrying? Like, yeah. It just, yeah, there's just uh -huh. a sense of it feeling worthless mm -hmm. because we know it's coming and it's that close but and you almost feel their frustration like why are we doing this yep. like, this is you know like we'll set up these things and then we're not really going to do that anymore. you have to rebuild the temple yeah. it has to be rebuilt but okay. in a couple hundred years you're not going to need it anymore right they're yeah. doing what they're supposed to do at the present time mm -hmm. which is frustrating i mean unless you are of the mindset that okay we have to the CMA church I grew up in, which was not even CMA, it was so crazy. It was just crazy. Um, but they were like, we've got to get missionaries out to every ends of the earth because the kingdom, we, we can make the kingdom come by mm -hmm. evangelizing everybody. Right. So that was their that was their goal. And unless you have that, then you're kind of thinking, okay, well, that doesn't fall on my response on my shoulders. Yeah, evangelism will happen if not through me, then through somebody else. Right. I'm just waiting for Jesus to come. I am so tired. I am so frustrated. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this? Right. Why are we playing church in a culture that hates us? Mm -hmm. I think very much like what Ezra and Nehemiah yeah. were going through. What's the point? Yeah. There's a very famous discussion that took place uh, with Gerstner when Gerstner was teaching up at Philadelphia College of the Bible, I think, maybe. I think this is about Philadelphia or Union, Philadelphia Seminary. I don't know, whatever the Presbyterian Seminary was in Philadelphia yeah. <laughs> that Gerstner taught at. We'll just leave it at that. He's sitting in a class, and Gerstner says, why do we do evangelism? Yeah. If Christ is going to return, and if the people that God is going to call, why do evangelism and why do missions? And there was an entire class of people, and he went around the whole room, and nobody could answer the question. And the last person he came to was R.C. Sproul. And R.C. Sproul said, gee, Dr. Gerstner, I don't know. The only thing I can think of is that God told us we had to. And Gerstner said, exactly. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That's it. That's it. You were told to. So, you know, if you want to base it on logic, if you want to base it on the, you know, I mean, it's why Presbyterians and people from a Reformed tradition often are, are rebuked for not doing missions and evangelism. Because supposedly we don't, because, of, well, everybody's going to be elect anyway, so it doesn't matter. You know, those who are elect, God's in a call, so who does he need me for? Well, you're the chosen means that God has chosen to do. Your job is to be faithful and to go out and do missions and to do evangelism and to do, you know, yeah, okay. So you, you, uh, you know, you spent time clearing some weeds out of a, out of a patch of ground and, you know, you think to yourself, yep, I, I fulfilled my creation mandate from, from Genesis chapter, chapter 1. I have taken dominion. I have done this. And it's all going to burn in fire at the end. Great. I'm glad I spent my Saturday afternoon doing that. You think to yourself, what a waste. Um, and there are times that in a church, you feel the same way. Uh, we invested all this time and all this energy into the church. And for what? You know, churches close doors, churches struggle, churches, you know, I, we almost want an immediate, you know, we did X, Y, and Z, and our church is exploding. we got more people to know what to do with. And it might be, uh, no, actually, I invested 50 years of my life and saw no converts, and the church shrunk, and, you know, but again, you're called to be faithful. 
And so as much as, as we see Ezra and Nehemiah be faithful, it's actually amazing that there's any response. Whereas I, I think sometimes, again, we are looking for such glorious things in the Old Testament as we're looking ahead to Christ that we forget the small things. And that's really what Zechariah emphasizes. Do not despise the day of small things. And I think what you're seeing in Ezra and Nehemiah are days of small things. We, you know, it took 23 years to rebuild the temple from 538-ish, 536, 537, somewhere in there until 515. Started, stopped, you know, for a variety of different reasons. You see them reading the law, and the people are weeping as they're hearing the law, and then you get to Malachi, and the people are like, yeah, what's the point? You know, again, you're like, well, wait a minute. We, we just talked about this, you know, not that many decades ago. You forgot already. Now you're even questioning if it's worth it to follow after God. And it, it can be easy to just say, oh, this is ridiculous. What's the point? Um, and yet, in some ways, I think that's why... Ezra and Nehemiah is such a crucial book, both for the return from exile, but also that ongoing encouragement of things are happening. You don't go from the end of Chronicles to Christ. You go from the end of Chronicles through Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther to Christ. And there's not always things that are glorious. They build the temple and then it's, you know, things happen and then things don't happen. And then you just end up, you're just waiting. And yet those days of small things, there are still faithful saints, there are still faithful people. Uh, some people have even suggested that, that this is the time period with Ezra when the law was actually written down and kind of began the tradition of putting the writings into, um, into the written form even that we have today. A lot of it had been communicated orally. That's why sometimes Ezra is suggested as the chronicler. And, you know, this is the time that Chronicles is being written. It's the time that all of these things are being put on paper. And the, the literary tradition of the Bible, as we know it, is kind of starting in this time period or has started even a little bit earlier during the exile. But it's kind of coming to fruition at this point. So that, you know, we sit here with our Hebrew Bibles, and it's kind of fascinating to think that some of these words that are here are here because Ezra put them here, uh, which is a just, you know, a, a powerful thing that you, you think to yourself, well, yeah, David wrote Psalms. Well, he did. But, you know, we even know from Proverbs that it's the men of Hezekiah that actually put the book of uh, Proverbs together. It's probably even around this time period, shortly beforehand, but around this time period that you have the five books of Psalms coming together as one book of Psalms. Um, they're ancient enough that the chronicler doesn't know what all the musical terms means because a lot of them he just translates literally he has no clue what they mean but he's he's uh you know he's he's pulling it all together they're pulling all these things together and creating what we know as the old testament so all of this is taking place and it seems like small things and they really are small things and yet it's just that gradual progressive step towards christ and I think the same we need to keep in mind for ourselves today of, you know, the, the, the days of small things. You know, someday, you know, however many hundreds of years from now, is anybody going to remember our names? Probably not. Um, you know, as much as I'd love to be a world-renowned you know, world Hebrew scholar, it still would be a very small piece. It would be. I, I mean, I, you know, we're 100 years only removed from Gesenius, and most people don't know who he is, even people who study Hebrew. So, you know, 100 years from now, is anybody going to remember who Van Pelt is? Or Kyle Ferguson? Is anybody going to remember, you know, is anybody going to remember Tim Hutchinson, the missionary to, to Panama or Ecuador? Is anybody going to remember, you know, maybe not. But God knows and we are being faithful to the calling that God has placed upon us of, okay, yeah, I, I'm ministering at Westminster. That's my calling. And I'm called to be faithful in that as much as sometimes I want to rip my hair out as much as Ezra and as much as any other pastor probably in the United States. 
who, regardless of the size of his church, wants to rip his hair out from time to time. But that's that's the small thing that we're called to. I think it also shows us how man-centered our brains think. Uh -huh. We read this and we're looking for some sort of heroism. We're looking for something. Okay, we just need to get the right guy. And I mean, we do this with politics, I think, in the conservative majority. But even in the Bible, we just need to get the right guy, faithful guy in here, and he'll turn the ship around. Mm -hmm. And we read through the Old Testament thinking that, you know, you think every single time you get somebody half decent, and maybe even just like an eighth decent, you think, okay, here we go. But when you say that we need to be faithful in the small things, or that these are the days of small things, mm -hmm. honestly, every day is small things. When you think about how minuscule you are in God's plan, even the people who played larger, more noticeable parts were tiny. And just to reorient Christian thinking, mm -hmm. I mean, I know you want to evangelize people and tell them God loves you, and you know, but there also should be that subtitle, God loves you and you're insignificant. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Yeah. But but just the duty orientedness of this, I just kept thinking of the phrase to obey is better than sacrifice through these mm -hmm. whole two books. Yeah. You are not important. The glory of God is important. Be faithful in whatever task that God has given you. Because the task that God has given you is too good for you. Mm -hmm. You can't even complete it, no matter how small it is. So just do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's not just, very inspiring, yeah. but... Mm -hmm. but <laughs> it is inspiring. It, 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 it's, uh, you know, it's very similar to, to Count Zinzendorf. Of, yeah. uh, you know, preach the gospel, die, be forgotten. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, very similar idea. And I think part of why it's helpful to read Ezra and Nehemiah alongside Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Yeah. Of, there are greater things coming that you know nothing about, and you just have to take it in faith. Especially when Haggai says soon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> soon, I mean 500 years. Soon, greater things are coming. And you just have to trust it. Of Greater things are coming. And the same with us today. Of Greater things are coming. But again, like Sarah said, in our minds... When we hear greater things are coming, we think that means that Westminster Presbyterian Church is going to double in size in the next year. Because greater things are coming. And if, if God the Father literally had eyes, they'd be rolling. He'd be rolling the medicine. Seriously? That's what you're thinking of when I say greater things are coming? No, I mean that eternity is coming. And sin is going to be gone. And the church is going to be glorious for all eternity. That's what I mean by greater. If you're worried about how many people you got your views, come on, really? But that's, that's often what we do. And yeah. so focusing ourselves on what Haggai says and, and Zechariah, you know, not by might or power, but by my spirit. And don't despise the day, the day of small things. And, and, you know, you're going to go out like calves released from the stall and trample down the wicked under your feet like burnt ashes. Not really, but you know the 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 idea is just. I mean, it's it's glorious, but it's just little by little. Yeah, like what you said about how often we think man centered. I think we sometimes judge the success or the progress of God based on what's happening right here. Yes, and we don't. I, I recently for the missions class, we he had us read a homeschool textbook on the spread of the gospel. And it literally went to every nation from one of the apostles. And yet we don't, we don't think about that. Right. And it was kind of the thing like, yeah, we're not on the topic of evangelism. We're not here creating a kingdom. Mm -hmm. We're announcing what's already in his dominion. Right. And so even when we can't see it, just like in Ezra and Nehemiah, they had no idea all the things that were in motion to prepare for the Messiah. Right. We can't see all that's been prepared mm -hmm. from right here because we're so. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And, I mean, the same, you know, we talked about how depressing the book of Judges was and all the things that happened in the book of Judges, and yet Judges is written in anticipation of David, but they didn't know that. We know that because we know how the book is written. But, you know, when they have Othniel, they're not thinking, you know, we need, we need David. No, they're thinking, hey, this Othniel guy is pretty cool. Samson, not so much. But they're not, you know, they're not thinking in terms of David. 
They're not even thinking in terms of a king at that point. And yet we know that that's where it's heading. But it took 400 years to get there. Uh, the same when they're in captivity in Egypt, 400 years. We don't know how long in that 400 they were slaves, but at least part of it. But 400 years, they're not in the promised land. And they're just, they're told, hey, someday you're going to go back. But they don't know when. I mean, Joseph <laughs> says, hey, take my bones back with you. But it's 400 years before they go back. Um, so, you know, in the grand scope of things, you know, we're living in that same, you know, world. It's almost like we're living in a period of judges or living in Ezra and Nehemiah. We're, we have something. It's great. It's wonderful. We rest in it. We rejoice in it. And yet we're still longing we're still longing for something else. Uh, so in that sense, Ezra and Nehemiah is a very, very encouraging book. Um, because it's as depressing as it is now. So, you know, it, it, it's not encouraging in the sense of, uh, no, things are much better than you think they are. It's actually, no, nope, it's about as bad as you think it is. But God is at work. Yeah. And greater things are coming. And, uh, and yeah, you just have to have to trust God in that. Is it the um, back at chapter three? That chapter that I, I can't, you can't get through without just bawling mm -hmm. towards the end of it. But, you know, right before the Babylonians come and annihilate them, take them away. I mean, he, you think of that chapter, where I, at least I do, when you're reading through all of this, like, he didn't know exactly what was coming after the Babylonians. Mm -hmm. But his response is faithfulness. Mm -hmm. The just will live by faith. Yeah. yeah. I, I, it's, it's one of the downsides, as it were, to how much we've emphasized justification by faith with Martin Luther, mm -hmm. is that we've forgotten that day by day we live by faith. So it wasn't, it's not just justification. Mm -hmm. It's, no, my righteous one will live by faith. We have to trust God. That he's that he's at work. A uh, couple more kind of random thoughts. Uh, one of them I thought it was interesting in uh, in Nehemiah at the end of Nehemiah. Well, one Nehemiah chapter eight. They uh, the people apparently don't know Hebrew because they're reading the law in Hebrew, and um, the people have to have to give it its sense in uh, in verse eight. Um, they read from the book of the law of God clearly, um, or some translations say paragraph by paragraph or with interpretation, but they read from the law of God um, and, uh, and they give it sense or they, they give it its, its wisdom or um, they're translating so that the people understood what was read. Uh, some people, and I think this is correct, have argued that this is basically the beginning of preaching. <laughs> that basically they're kind of sermonizing and explaining to the people, this is what the law of God says. Which is probably something priests were always supposed to have done and probably did. But this is one of the first times that we actually see it taking place. They're probably translating it from Hebrew into Aramaic. Uh, and then they're also actually giving it sense and explaining to the people, this is what the text means. This is, uh, they're interpreting it and, uh, and, and telling the people what's going on there. Uh, and then also fascinating is that they celebrate the festival. Uh, they've already ce celebrated the Passover. Um, but then um, they celebrate the uh, Festival of Booths. Um, they found it uh, commanded by Moses that the people should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month, that they should proclaim it and publish it in all their towns. So they went out and made booths. And all the assembly of those who had returned from captivity made booths. For the days of, from the days of Joshua, the son of Nun, the people of Israel had not done so, and there was great rejoicing. Um, why? Why in the Feast of Booths? Well, question about that. why is that? I guess because like they hadn't celebrated it since Joshua. So it says because when the Second Temple was built, they said it was finished during the 
festival of beers in the seventh month, same as Solomon's mm -hmm. temple. Yes, so like is as religious writing, hey, this was the time during the festival of beers, but no one really knew that at that time. Or there's yeah, a similar okay. kind of thing yeah. at the end of Kings, because mm -hmm. it's like they never yeah. had a Passover like this one. Yeah. Yep. But then they did. Right. Times. Yeah, it, it's um, it's uh it's possible that it it is um yeah that they had not not done it in the same way. Um it says literally for they had not done so or they had not done um thus for they had not done from the days of of Joshua. So it's possible that it's saying they hadn't celebrated it like they did, you know, in the same way. So they, they made it a bigger deal than it had been since the time of Joshua. Um, it's also possible that, yeah, they didn't live in booths, that they had celebrated that festival as, as something else. Because yeah. mm -hmm. uh, it does come at the end of the festival, or at the end of the harvest. So it's, it's almost like a, an end of, end of um, in fact, uh, I think it's called the Festival of, now I'm not remembering. There's another name for it that's given elsewhere. Um, the Festival of Weeks, I think. Oh, I'll have to double check that. I should know this, I just preached on it. The Feast of the Ingathering? Yeah, there's that one too. Um, That's like Pentecost. Yeah, you shall celebrate the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end. Um, then uh, Numbers 28 also mentions. Um, On the first day of the seventh month, have a holy convocation. You shall not do ordinary work. It is a day for you to blow the trumpets, and you shall offer a burnt offering. Besides the burnt offering, on the tenth day of the seventh month, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall afflict yourselves and do no work. Offer an offering, grain offering, uh, and then it drops the number of offerings each day until the end. Um, so that on the seventh day, it's seven bulls, two rams. On the eighth day is a solemn assembly. You not do any work. Um, but there's no mention there of booths. So it's possible that they off, you know, they had this off, this festival at the end, but that they didn't, they just didn't do the booths part. So what would be the significance of the booths? I guess it calls it during the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I mean, kind of what we're saying is still like they're still in the, they're still they're in the wilderness right now, right? Yes. So I think it's very appropriate that they're off, they're doing this festival of booths. They've been liberated from Egypt. They're being provided for in the wilderness. They've been liberated from Assyria. They're in the wilderness, but they're they're yearning for they're yearning for the promised land, and they're they're waiting and and I. I think it's also part of why it's not mentioned as booths so much in Exodus and Numbers is that they're still they're still in the yeah. in the wilderness, so they're still living in the booths. Mm -hmm. So to make booths to celebrate the fact that you live in a booth right. might not work. But later on, they're told, "No, this is the feast of booths. You need to celebrate this." So you know they're yearning for that, almost like the new temple, or they're yearning for that new that new era. Is there a wider connection just with building houses in general? Since both temples are also, like, both temple building accounts point out that the temples were finished in the Feast of Booths. I think that's significant in that um, the, the, the building of the temple and the filling of the temple with Solomon almost officially marked the end of the Exodus. Yeah. So it, in some ways, yeah, the building of this second temple Kind of marked the ending of of the exile 
but yet they're still they're still doing this festival even though the temple is built as though they're still yearning for okay we have the temple but there's still something more that we're waiting for there's still another there's another thing another temple um because yeah the it kind of reflected back on the provision of God in the wilderness, but also looked ahead to something that was yet to come. So there is there is quite a bit of significance about the seventh day. That you know Haggai's prophecies are made on the seventh month. They're made during the Feast of, Tab of, of Booths. And uh, interesting at the end of Zechariah, when you kind of read about this great completion of things, the only festival that's mentioned. Is the Feast of Booths. Uh, so there's definitely kind of this, this connection of the Feast of Booths that runs through the whole Old Testament. It seems all the way into the eschaton that it just continues. And uh, so there's definitely a significance to that, that that's the one that's highlighted with all of its meaning tied to the temple and tied to the community and tied to the cloud, the glory cloud of God in their midst, and just all of it tied together is... Uh, is very significant. So it's definitely not an accident that they're highlighting this one rather than any other festival. Um, yeah, and I think that's why Haggai then stands up prior to this passage, but he that's why he stood up in that seventh month and talked about the rebuilding of the temple. Of, it's the seventh month, guys. Come on, why aren't you building the temple? That's what the whole point of this seventh month thing is. And yet they've forgotten. And yet, it's fascinating they have the temple and yet they're still doing it yeah and so they're still they're still remembering something more and um there's been quite a lot written on on that festival of booths <laughs> and um how even the booth itself was supposed to represent christ in the new testament mm. so there's just a lot of a lot of uh, fascinating imagery and connection even there uh, one last thing, and it's it's not really a big deal, but um, uh, we do have in uh, Ezra chapter 2, we have him give this genealogy of all the people who have returned, and he sums it up and says that there were 42,360 men, or people <laughs> Uh, actually, if you add them all up, you get 29,818. I did that this afternoon. No. <laughs> no. In Nehemiah, chapter 7, verse 61, he also says that there are 42,360. However, there are 31,089 men mentioned by Nehemiah. Um, actually, I take that back. Uh, Yeah, that's no, right, 31,089. Uh, Ezra lists uh, 494 people that are not listed in Nehemiah. Nehemiah has 1,765 people that are not in the book of Ezra. And Somehow, I must have written the wrong number down here, but if you add the extras from Ezra's list and the extras to Nehemiah's list, you end up with 31,583, which is significantly short of the 42,360 that Ezra mentions in chapter 2, verse 64, and Nehemiah mentions in chapter 7, verse 66. So, how do we account for the missing 10,777? Uh, the most likely explanation is that Ezra and Nehemiah are giving totals only for Judah and Benjamin. And that the whole congregation numbered 42,360, but out of that 10,777 were from other tribes or clans. Uh, we know, uh, and actually, if you look on um, on Younger's notes, he says, "I just saw it. Where did I see it?" Uh, 
Uh, here we go. Um, 42,360 with 7,337 servants returning. So the servants do not count with the 42,360. So it would also make sense that the tribes that aren't mentioned would also be counted separately. So that probably accounts for the other 10,777. So Ezra recorded the families of Judah and Benjamin who had left Babylon in 538 BC with Zerubbabel. That total was 29,818 men. Later, in 445 BC, Nehemiah brought another group of exiles back to Jerusalem. And by that time, 93 years later, the numbers in Jerusalem had grown to 31,089 men. So the differences in the two lists are, can be attributed to the death and birth of members in each family. And when all the tribes of Israel are included in the count, then the congregation numbers 42,360. So they're giving accurate lists 93 years apart, but the number is the same because they're using the same, the same total number of the people who came back. But their names and the number of names don't necessarily add up to that number because they're using a number from one place and they're using a list of details from another because for them it doesn't matter they don't actually need 42,000 names in order to to line it up so yeah that's just my last thought for the day I, I know that was going to keep you all awake tonight um, so yeah uh, actually I do have one other thought um, why even bother to include a genealogy? And uh, the list may be a list of legitimizing the land rights as they're returning from exile. It may also be intended to distinguish true Israelites from Samaritans and show in the face of Tatnai's challenge in Ezra chapter 5 that those who were authorized by Cyrus to return and build the temple were actually the ones who were returning and building the temple. And that the author and his readers were concerned about the continuity of this community with the pre-exilic Jewish nation to show it's the same people. They didn't go get mixed up in Babylon and then pick a bunch of random Babylonians to come back. No, it was important to show that this community, though small and weak, still continued God's plan for Israel. It's the same group of people. Uh, Derek Kidner, uh, who's one of my favorite commentators, he says, this chapter, however uninviting as it may seem, is a monument to God's care and to Israel's vitality. The thousands of homecomers are not lumped together, but in characteristic biblical fashion are related to those local and family circles which humanize a society and orientate, and, and orientate an individual. And for the people's part, their tenacious memory of places and relationships still strong after two generations in exile showed a fine refusal to be robbed of either their past or their future. Kidner goes on to make the point that the fundamental motive for this careful grouping was not social, but religious. In this new opportunity for Israel to live up to its calling, every priest must have its credential and every member too. The close of the chapter shows the restored nation orderly, structured, and ready for its main purpose, namely worship. That seems like a good place to end. So there we go, we got two hours out of Ezra and Nehemiah. Fantastic. Any questions or comments on Ezra and Nehemiah as we? That was interesting, your point about like, who's going to remember you? Uh -huh. And that's how Nehemiah ends. Three times he says, Lord, remember me. Mm -hmm. Yes. Which is maybe kind of the point of the small things, you know, that like, mm -hmm. God does and will, and that's enough. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yep. I have a question about Ezra chapter 10. Yes. I, is it correct to make a correlation or wait? Mm. So on the, the issue of intermarriage, uh -huh. is it right to make a correlation between them not intermarrying with peoples of the other cultures and Christians not intermarrying with non-Christians today? 
mm -hmm. that a possible like I, mean, I didn't want to overstep the correlations to make, but yeah, I wasn't sure. Like, well, yeah, you can marry anyone of a different culture now. Right. The non-Christian is mm -hmm. the new pagan culture from yeah. Them. Yeah, I would say that that's accurate. I mean, Paul talks about how um, bad company corrupts good character and says, don't be unequally yoked. Um, and to some degree, I would say that it even, it's not even just marriage, but business relationships and any other yoking that takes place, you just have a different worldview and you're working on different goals and working towards different ends. Um, but yeah, I would, I would definitely say that that would be a correlation. Uh, the one thing that I find fascinating, and we didn't, actually didn't get to this tonight, is uh, it sounds like Ezra is telling everybody to divorce their wives. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's uncomfortable. Yeah. And, and in a way, he is. He's, he basically annuls all the marriages, even the ones that had children. He says. Right. Yes. I saw it. Yes. So that's how we still feel about that. Very Augustinian of him. Yeah, and there's really no comment on it. Right. And there's really no um yeah, there's no real discussion. It it's yeah, it is it I guess would it be seen by God as illegitimate? Better than having slaughtered it. Because yeah. because they were they were married. Yeah. In an illegitimate fashion. So mm -hmm. I guess like for instance, like a homosexual marriage today would be right. illegitimate, and that would be right to, to cut off, yes. even if none of the normal right. reasons for divorcing would apply, could that apply here? Like, this is not even a legitimate form of marriage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would put it in, in the right context of, of this marriage is so wrong that there's nothing it's not even redeemable. It's not a mandate to, yeah. for you to be in this. And that would be one difference between um, Christian and non-Christian marriage, is that you know, Christian marries a non-Christian, it was wrong. But now you're married. Okay, yeah. you and, now. yep, you made a bad decision, but now you're married. And uh, so that's, that's one difference. But Paul seems to be fairly explicit with that, as though he's trying to correct the assumption that even in the New Testament era, if you become a Christian, you just leave your non-Christian spouse. And he says, nope, if they'll have you, you stay. So, and if you were dumb enough to marry a non-Christian, you stay with them. And yeah, that's... He more points out the abrogation of what was once illegitimate, I guess. Right. So I, I think that Paul may mention that specifically because of the fact that that was the tradition in the Old Testament, was you, you put, away, put away that wife. It is interesting because there are provisions made in the Old Testament for how to marry a woman that's captured in battle. Hmm. But the idea of actually intermarrying with foreign wives. Yeah, I was going to ask how we square this with Ruth. Yeah. Yeah, especially because Ruth is a, uh, she's a Moabite, which was kind of the lowest of the low. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But um, is it the difference between showing mercy and like a lot of times a marriage is for your own gain or you know, mm -hmm. some kind of family connection? Yeah, that's one of the things that's a little curious about it is that. It's not women who married men, it's men who married women. And usually the woman would go along with what the man said. You know, your God is my God, your people my people. And yet they're not even given that opportunity to make that statement. Um, so, I, yeah, I, it is a rather perplexing end to the book of they put away the foreign wives, which in, in terms of... of the didactic element of it, of that's how serious God takes it, that we don't intermarry or become unequally yoked. He takes it that seriously. And yet, on the other hand, it is, uh, it is rather, rather fascinating. Uh, the, 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 um, the, the part on divorce in Malachi chapter 2 is very convoluted in Hebrew and trying to figure out um, what it is that Malachi is saying. Um, you know, I hate divorce and I hate a man covering himself with violence and, and that whole statement. Uh, Dr. Van Gemmeren, who is my professor, he connects the two and thinks that that statement has to do with this, the sending away of the wives, and that it's not so much the divorcing that God is complaining about in Malachi as you put away your, your foreign wives, but you did so 
in a in a violent, unmerciful way, rather than you're you're sending them out from you, um, you know, and providing for them. And but yeah, it, it is a it is quite the conundrum and quite the question of of yeah, you're divorcing them or annulling the marriages. Yeah. And then coming back, you know, however many years later with Nehemiah and doing it all over again. Right. What does that verb put away actually mean? This, at least in the English, that's kind of a strange way to describe mm -hmm. an annulment or divorce. And someone's just like, they're putting them in a closet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Just hide them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, basically to uh, to send send them out. So almost like um, oh, what's her name? Sarah's slave. Uh huh. Girl. Yes, like, to yeah. cast her out. Yeah. Yep. See, that seems like a punishment on the women and the children when it was the men's sins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's when they probably yep. wouldn't have had much to say about the matter. Or I would have been an angry four in a way. Like some people with me. Um. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, uh, yeah, it's just send them out. It's the, yeah, it's not the same. It's not the same. And is that a command from God or is that a command from Ezra or both? Uh, I think both. Yeah, um, because the word for cast out is um, is the word drive out, same word that shows up in uh, in the Garden of Eden narratives as he drove them out east yeah. of Eden. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the cast out the slave woman that shows up in uh, in Genesis uh, chapter twenty one. Um, so here it's just yeah. Put away. Um, yeah, it actually appears to be the same word. Let me double check this. That uh, and they go through this whole like several months long process of judging. Mm -hmm. Like they're judging each case. Like what are they, what are they judging exactly? Just like hey, you have a foreign wife. Go stick her in the wilderness somewhere. It, it does or, seem like it would be a pretty quick process um maybe it, it seems like in the law there is some kind of provision made for people who mm -hmm. want to join the covenant people of israel and worship god yeah maybe is there some way for applying that kind of a judicial sense for that word just well yeah i mean he does say let it be done according to the law And yeah, you wonder, um, yeah, you wonder if, uh, if, if that's what it is of, okay, we're going to make this official. Yeah. Let all in our cities who have taken foreign wives come at a point in time with them, the elders and judges, until the fierce matter is taken away. Um, do they have like a window to weed out people who just say they're going to worship God? Mm -hmm. They're watching them to see if they carve any idols or anything. Or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. It's a, it's a uh, test on the law. Mm hmm Yeah, it is it is a fascinating way to end the book. Um, and then to do the same at the end of uh, of Nehemiah. Yeah, no, it's a it's a it is a fascinating, uh, just a fascinating end. I don't really have any other, other, um, any other explanation other than just to say that, yeah, they, 
they in some way uh, either sent out or cast out the, the foreign wives or somehow, according to the law, dealt with it how it needed to be dealt with. Um, so I, I don't know, it's almost as though the text is trying to say the details of how they took care of it aren't necessarily as important as that they took care of it. Yeah. And uh, which you know, drives me nuts, so, but I wanna know, how'd you do it? Yeah, but that's how seriously they take this intermarrying. Yeah, they take it very seriously. Uh, yeah. Well, next week we'll look at uh, Esther. And um, we do have Esther and Nehemiah on the syllabus for two weeks. Oh, we're not going to do it two weeks. I didn't, uh, didn't figure. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. Uh, so we are, uh, we're actually coming to the end of the semester, which is just crazy to think. Um, so the, um, yeah, so we're uh, going to have our last class is that first Thursday in May. Yes, and uh, tradition, at least in my classes, has been that we have our last class at a restaurant. If you're all comfortable with that. Tim, you're welcome to join us if you want to fly from California to join us for dinner. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the, the question would be, where did y'all want to meet? You don't have to come up with it now. Uh, if you're comfortable going somewhere. Um, if not, we'll make other arrangements. We've, because of COVID, we haven't always gone to a restaurant, but we have always had dinner. Although I think we skipped it. Did we? You were in my class last semester. You remember? Did we, I think we skipped dinner. For exegesis. I don't think anybody was interested, so I think we just skipped it. Because it was Christmas time and everybody was too busy, and we're like, you know what? Let's just not have it. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So we went to that place. We went where? When we stole you to that place and we didn't know where you were going. That's right, yes. <laughs> well, that was, the yes, that like, also. We get him to not have class, and I'm like, oh, I'm not interested, and I don't think anybody else is <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. We, that's right. We went away and celebrated my 40th birthday. That's right. It's yeah. so funny. I was kind of abducted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's great. It's great. We had a lot of fun. Not very well. so, okay. Yeah, we'll think about it. We can talk about it the next couple of weeks of where we want to meet. Um, yeah, so the, the I'll get your rough drafts and your finals or your midterms graded and such and get those back to you ASAP. So that you can uh, get those to Yep. Just a couple weeks, so I'll probably get the papers done first so that you can look at those. And uh, yeah, all right. Well, have a great night. Oh, he already left. Never mind. Fine. Don't